Hi everyone, welcome to uh, part three of our Ethical Implications of Emerging Virtual and Augmented Reality Technologies lecture series. In this lecture, I'm gonna be discussing some of the ethical implications of VR and AR that ha are to do with surveillance and platform capitalism. So if you're not familiar with this idea, uh, to def kind of broadly define these terms, that are often used within critical political economy of contemporary digital capitalism. Platform or surveillance capitalism typically describes the business practices of digital platforms and companies that make platforms and devices that extract data about the world and about us. So this is instead of thinking about Facebook as just a social media company or a networking website, but as a, a platform that is extracting data about us and then using that data to make money through deli the delivery of targeted advertisements. So via this lens, we understand how it is that big tech companies and why it is that big tech companies place a heavy emphasis upon the accumulation and expropriation of user data as a mechanism for both profit and power. As Cernicek writes in Platform Capitalism, many platform companies have through expansive cross-subsidying practices moved into the sale of various forms of digital sensors. Things like the Google Home voice assistant or the Amazon Ring doorbell sensor. The value of the data that these devices collect allows for the reduced price of a service or good, often for free in the case of Facebook, leading to more users, allowing for money to be made elsewhere from the data. Platforms acquiring things like virtual reality, Facebook bought Oculus in 2014 for an estimated two billion US dollars, provides them with granular data that may otherwise not be available, which can then subsequently be monetized by that platform owner. Facebook's acquisition of Oculus is a great example of this. And Hellman and colleagues describe Facebook's uh, purchase of Oculus as part of Facebook's post IPO process of infrastructural expansion and acquisition representing an instance of what Cernicek describes as the expansive and extractive nature of platform capitalism. While Facebook have claimed to only be using information about user software uh, in order to target people with related advertisement, right now that just means that you have a VR headset so you're gonna get VR adverts. Considering Facebook's history of unscrupulous business practices, such as their privacy violations around facial recognition, these concerns shouldn't be dismissed as exaggerated or alarmist. Ben Anglison and I have recently published an article in New Media and Society that analyzes the narrative that's produced by Facebook about Oculus as something that's integrated into and enhancing the experience of Facebook's wider suite of social software. What we argue in this article is that the purpose of this narrative is to construct or sell a Facebook-specific vision of VR's potential, one that's appealing both to end users and platform complementers. Moreover, a vision that appears to be conducive to Facebook's current methods for accumulating profit and power via the collection of data about its users and the use of this data to deliver targeted advertisements. In this paper, we also argue that Facebook moves with VR uh, align with what Niebuhr and Pohl call the platformization of cultural production. This describes a dynamic where platform owners attempt to encourage widespread use and eventually to eventually become dependent upon their platform. Facebook present Oculus in ways that are as appealing as possible to platform developers, such as through uh, the software development kit that can be integrated into popular game engines like Unity and Unreal. As Maxwell Foxman notes elsewhere, other big tech companies operating in the mixed reality space like Google and Microsoft also offer software development kits for use with things platforms like Unity. And Microsoft is increasingly positioning the Windows operating system as a holographic computing platform. These moves recognize that owning the platform for VR, much like how Apple owned the platform of the iPhone for mobile apps and the transactions we make in those apps, is a source of enormous value. The value of this platform is in the value of the data that it collects and the data collection potential of VR is enormous. As Jeremy Balenson writes, 
Commercial VR systems typically track body movements 90 times per second to display the scene appropriately and the high-end systems record 18 types of movement across the head and the hands. Consequently, spending 20 minutes in a VR simulation leaves just under 2 million unique recordings of body language. While well, Facebook have claimed to only be using this information about user software in order to target users with related advertising, considering Facebook's history, we wonder what might this data be used to do? Exacerbating these concerns, the data that's collected about you using current VR platforms is a behavioral biometric. The way that you move your body and use VR is so unique that we could identify you from an anonymous data set of users. So if you have a data set of people using a VR application, it's potentially never anonymizable. The next generation of virtual reality devices with eye tracking data and heart rate sensors will likely to be able to do this to an even greater degree. Writing in the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Rui Murr and Katiza Rodriguez argue that the owners of this data may actually be able to identify patterns that let them more precisely predict or cause certain behavior or emotions in the virtual world. It may allow companies to exploit users' emotional vulnerabilities through strategies that are difficult for the user to perceive and resist. What makes the collection of this sort of biometric data particularly frightening is that unlike a credit card or a password, it's information about us that we can't change. Once it's collected, there's very little we can do to mitigate the harm done by leaks or data being monetized with additional parties. In her book, Surveillance Capitalism, Tashana Zaboff gives some attention to the augmented reality game Pokemon Go, suggesting it is a mundane example of surveillance capitalism, how the accumulation of data about almost all aspects of everyday life is part of a recent and, and deeply corrosive tendency of capitalism. As Zuboff notes, augmented reality games and software operate as digital sensors that are tracking spatial and geographical movement and can be leveraged by surveillance capitalists in order to drive behavior in particular ways. For example, location data as a way to drive business traffic to partnered locations and things like that. But there's a great journalistic article by Cecilia De Anastasio and Dove Marotra point out, Niantic capture granular locational data about users in their games. They write about Harry Potter Wizards Unite, which is similar to Pokemon Go. Because the location data collected by Niantic is so granular, sometimes up to 13 location records a minute, it's possible to discern individual patterns of user behavior, as well as intimate details about a player's life. There are also pertinent questions about how the accumulation of data by Niantic in its previous games was used to develop maps for Pokemon Go. As Mike Pesci suggests, there's questions about data ownership, questions about how data is being used by large tech companies, for instance, in the training of machine learning algorithms, which become increasingly granular as the capacities of AR develop further. We just don't know what the data you're giving up right now is gonna be used to do. In a Real Life Magazine article, I write with Ben Eggleston about a further challenge with this extensive data collection. In addition to being concerned about the richness of the data that's collected by VR, a further risk arises in the subsequent overconfidence in the decisions that we make based on our belief in the veracity of this data. There's this fantasy that VR technology companies are purporting that the data collected about us during a VR experience is complete. It captures what theorist Mark Andreevich calls framelessness, a complete picture of the world in machine readable form. But VR is no more perfect or accurate than any other measurement scheme. Like any quantification of behavior, it's based on normative and exclusionary assumptions that are often gendered, classed, and raced in their origin and outlook. As Rob Kitchen has argued, data is often erroneously framed as being objective, neutral, and free of bias. As though it's simply this natural and essential element that's collected from the world in neutral and objective ways. Data is never a neutral representation. It is always collected for a specific purpose. It makes visible something that was previously concealed, and it constructs a new view about the world. In other words, 
as Gardelman and Virginia Jackson, as Lisa Gardelman and Virginia Jackson put it, data is never raw. It is always cooked, collected, stored, and circulated with particular aims and logics in mind. Despite this, predictive analytics are increasingly being applied to VR data to shape our lives based on this pervasive belief in data's inherent objectivity. Walmart is already using virtual reality in its hiring and promotion process to simulate everyday obstacles a potential employee might face. Now, while Walmart emphasizes that VR assessment is only one of the data points used in the hiring process, its tech partner Striver describes how much it claims to extract from a VR session, claiming to provide objective and automated prediction of a trainee's capability to deal with an emotional customer using things like verbal analytics. But speech recognition software works best for white, highly educated upper middle class Americans. Deploying this in VR scenarios merely extends the application of bias and the pervasive beliefs in data's inherent objectivity obscures its likely training on data sets of neurotypical white, highly educated male, able-bodied engineers. This is a form of what Shia Swarga, borrowing from disability scholar Leonard Davis calls eugenic gaze, codifying xenophobia, ableism and white supremacy behind the black box of algorithms while avoiding equity-based critiques because of this pervasive belief in the neutrality of data and technology. Concealing this bias, this unfairness, and this prejudice against people who don't speak and move in normative ways. Despite this, the value of these companies is increasingly becoming tied to the quantity of data they've already collected about users, and the speculation that the machine learning it's going to be able to extract from this data new models about learning and, and expertise that can be monetized further in the future. Moving on from VR and looking instead now at augmented reality, Keichi Matsuda's dystopian hyperreality provides an amazing vision of how this data accumulation might be applied to direct and monetize users' attention in the physical world. In the video, Future in the, in the augmented reality future that Matsuda paints, our environments overlaid with a constant feed of information, much of which is advertising, serving the interests of powerful tech companies who currently derive profits in this way by the data it captured through the internet and mobile media. But beyond the modulatory power of these interfaces to serve the logics and motives of the advertisers at social media companies like Facebook, the capture of granular information about our homes and our cities also shows the potential for a harder and more harmful wielding of these technologies. It's not difficult to imagine these technologies being co-opted by the state through partnerships between state and big tech companies that are commonplace. Complementing exact, existing state enacted cartography becoming increasingly granular as the capacities of AR develop further. I've left the video to the full six minute hyper reality video before, below and I'm really interested to hear what you think of it. So thanks for checking out this video in the series. Don't forget to look at the full ethical implications of emerging mixed reality technologies report, link in the bio, which has further details on all of these aspects and references to many of the topics that I talk about. I'm Marcus Carter. Thanks for engaging with this lecture and I hope you'll keep watching the next one. Thanks very much.